Okay, it is about that time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and admit some folks as they come. So thank you all for joining us for this breakout session. Uh, we're really pleased today to have one of our distinguished Westminster alumnas, Betsy Sharp Lynch, with us today. Um, so before we begin, a few notes about format. So we will have some time for questions and answers later in the session. Until that time, we'd ask that you remain on mute. Um, but you'll be able to submit some questions through the chat. You can submit those anytime. We'll have some question of time for those questions at the end. So please feel free to submit some questions so we can have some discussion later on. And uh, now we're also lucky to ha have someone here to introduce our speaker for this session. So we are going to welcome another distinguished Westminster alum, Judge Mark Pfeiffer. Judge Pfeiffer is a 1989 graduate of Westminster and received his law degree from the University of Missouri um, Columbia School of Law. He serves on the Missouri Court of Appeals for the Western District. He is also, some of you may remember, realize, a faculty member um, for us and teaches in our pre-law program. So please now welcome Judge Pfeiffer, who will introduce today's speaker to us. Thank you, Professor. Uh, this is a great honor for me, and, and um, as was noted, I, I do get the privilege of uh, every other year, I teach a class at Westminster College uh, in the pre-law department, uh, the uh, American Jurisprudence class. In fact, I think I recognize a few of my former students that are uh, logging into this uh, symposium. And as we've discussed in that class, one of the things we talk about is uh, living the mission of Westminster College after you graduate. Uh, and I think so many of you are involved in whether it is a Greek or an independent organization, whether it's some sort of a pre-law uh, type of organization or other uh, extracurricular organization at Westminster College, and you develop sort of a group of friends that you spend most of your time with at Westminster. Uh, but I assure you that when you graduate from uh, Westminster College, you, you graduate and you then become a part of the brother and sisterhood, which is, uh, which is derived from Mother Westminster. And, and what we are, when we go out into our communities, uh, we're part of Westminster College. And, and I think you, uh, you relate less and less to a group that you are a part of at Westminster College and more and more to the mission of Westminster College. And I think the, the mission of Westminster College has always been and continues to be that of servant leadership. And Betsy is a perfect example of that. And she is living the mission. She graduated from uh, Westminster in 2002, and she went on to law school, she graduated from UMKC School of Law three years later. And over the last 15 years, I am frankly amazed at all the different areas of certainty that Betsy developed. Uh, she is absolutely a leader in the Kansas City uh, legal arena. She has developed expertise in business law, in bankruptcy law, real estate and contracts, consumer law, estate planning, uh, and she performs services as an arbitrator. Uh, she got her start early in her career with uh, one of the most respected judges uh, in Jackson County history, and she has not let her mentor down. Uh, she really is a tremendous lawyer, and you are in for a treat to have the opportunity uh, to listen to Betsy today. Uh, but I, what I really want to talk about uh, most with Betsy and what I want to remind everybody in the room about is that though she has all of this expertise in the law, she uses it to serve her community. She uses it to serve her clients. Uh, when you look at her resume, what stands out is the service to community, volunteer work that she does in the community. And it's hard to know where she finds enough hours in the day, but she is committed to serving the community. Uh, I think we all have to ask a simple question when we wake up every day, whom will I serve? Will I serve my ego? or will I serve others? And I think Betsy has chosen the path of serving others. And so it is with uh, great pride that I introduce uh, not just my colleague, but my good friend, 
uh, Betsy Lynch, and I am very much looking forward to her presentation today. Thank you so much, Judge. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here and get going. I was I was asked today to uh, talk to you about my story and my journey from Westminster into the legal community. And uh, part of that you, you can't really understand unless you know where I've come from. So um, I am from a little town called Sykeston, Missouri. It's a dot on a state road map. Um, I spent a small amount of my childhood down in Arkansas in very, very small towns, the largest of which only had 10,000 people in it. Um, my mother, when I was about six years old, was in a drunk driving accident and she became what they call a hemiplegic. So she's paralyzed on her right side and she has a head injury that uh, exudes a number of symptoms. Um, you know, she has short term memory problems. So I always explain it to my kids. The reason gran granny can't remember your name is because she's kind of like Dory from Finding Nemo. <laughs> but, um, you know, we moved back to Sykeston after her accident so that uh, a lot of family and friends could kind of pitch in and help with our family. And uh, I am the youngest uh, in my family. I'm the only girl. And uh, after that accident, I really got the sense of uh, the idea that it really does take a village to uh, raise a child and uh, to make them a part of a bigger community. Uh, I am a product of the Sykeston public school system. You know, there weren't really any private schools that we could attend. So uh, we, we did go to public school. I was always a straight A student. I played basketball, I twirled flaming batons. Uh, my kids still don't believe me when I tell them that. But um, one of the interesting things about Sykeston, you know, again, it's a small town. It's got a few little claims to fame. Uh, but the thing that always struck me at my chord growing up in Sykeston was uh, the idea of what women could do uh, as professions. And in my family, the women were always housewives. Some were nurses. If they worked, they were teachers. Um, but the idea that you would do something different uh, was, th these are stats from 2000 for Sykeston as to uh, common industries that, that women were holding in, in that area. And you'll notice that the legal profession doesn't appear on any, any of them. Uh, when I was about seven years old, I remember my uh, little second grade class having a career day and you had to dress up like something you wanted to be for career day. And, you know, the little boys would dress up like police officers or firemen. And the only woman lawyer I knew was Claire Huxtable from The Cosby Show. And so that's what I dressed up as. Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, uh, there wasn't a lot of room for female ambition in my hometown, but my father had always raised me to have a certain set of values and to always know that no matter who you are and what you do, if you work hard, you can get and achieve anything you want. Um, a lot of those values I had to learn at a very early age due to what had happened to my mother. Um, you know, these are, these are some core values that I really wanted to talk to you all about today. In my opinion, you know, you're not going to find any place on earth that's going to be more loyal to their people and their friends than you're, than you're going to find in the rural Midwest. Uh, you know, growing up with a handicapped mother, I think it made me infinitely more empathetic to other people, people who were different than me, people who looked different than me, who had different backgrounds, um, and to really understand that everybody's sort of walking a path that maybe you don't know enough about. Um, when you have a disabled person in your tight family unit, the other thing you have to grow up with is uh, adaptability. So things change at any given moment. My mother was in and out of the hospital all the time and you have to drop things at the, you know, 
at the drop of a hat, you got to run off and go do something. So you have to have the ability to sort of change and grow and work and be flexible. Uh, and the other thing it really instilled in me was my father was a banker and he went to work every day. I mean, seven days a week, he was always there. He was working himself to death. And even though my mother uh, had her own challenges. She also did a whole lot of things for the community. You know, she was a room mom in elementary school and she served on the board of the local soup kitchen and she would drag her teenage kids down to the soup kitchen on the weekends and she would sit there and tally the numbers of the people walking in so the, the soup kitchen could have an accurate count of who was there. So it, she never let challenges that she had get in the way of serving others and serving her community. And I think she really instilled that in our family. The other thing it showed us is that, uh, you know, perseverance, I, I don't know anybody who, who worked harder than her to, to come back from uh, a debilitating car wreck. I mean, when she had her accident, the doctors had told us she's never gonna walk, she's never gonna talk, she's never gonna do anything other than lay in a hospital bed. And she really proved everyone wrong. Um, and it took a whole lot of work in order to do that. So one of the things I remember most about Sykeston that I think speaks to some of this perseverance was uh, everybody when they were in, I think it might've been about eighth grade, had to take the pre-ACT and I was never a very good test taker. I think I got like a 15 on the AC, the pre-ACT. And you go and you meet with your guidance counselors and they talk to you about what your options are and what you need to do. And my guidance counselor basically sat me down and through, for lack of a better way of putting it, basically told me she didn't think I was gonna be smart enough to go to college. And my dad came home and course I'm crying and in tears and you know don't know what to do and he basically told me to go out there and prove everybody wrong and if I wanted to go to college I could do it and I'd go anywhere I wanted and nothing was going to stop me from doing it. Uh, eventually I took the ACT I think about five times because I kept trying to get a 30. You know if you got a 30 back in my day you could go to a state school for free. And I kept trying to get a 30 and I think I got a 29 on it about four times. So I had taken a class up at the Sylvan Learning Center in a different town and I studied my butt off and it paid off. So eventually I got to Westminster College. Uh, it was a very old family tradition in our family. My grand, great grandfather was a Fidelt. Uh, I have an uncle who was a Fidel in the 50s. My dad was a Beta in the 70s. I had another uncle who was a Sigma Chi in the 80s. And then from 98 to 2000, when I was there, I had two cousins and my, my brother were there. Uh, so it's sort of an old family tradition. You'll also notice that all of the people that I mentioned, uh, none of them were women. <laughs> they were all men, so it's a big joke in my family that I'm the, I'm the only girl who uh, ever graduated from, from Westminster. You know, when you get to college, there's a lot of emphasis on what classes you're going to take, and you've got to pick your major. So I went off to college thinking I was going to be a structural engineer. Uh, I liked math a lot. I had some people skills and I thought maybe I could work my way up in engineering because I had the people skills that some engineers lacked. And Westminster had a 3-2 program where you would go three years at Westminster and two at WashU and you would get an engineering degree from both universities. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go do that. And then about a year in, I realized, well, I think I can get the same jobs with a physics degree that I can get with this engineering degree, but I can get the physics degree in four years. So I switched over to physics and then I realized that was insane uh, because physics is really hard. <laughs> and uh, I kept getting B pluses and I really wasn't used to that. I was very used to being a straight A student. It was kind of driving me crazy. So then uh, I think later in my sophomore year, I decided I wanted to be a math major and took a bunch of math courses. and. 
was doing really well. And then it dawned on me one day, my dad said, well, what are you going to do with your math degree? Uh, and I said, well, I have no idea. Uh, so the only thing you could really do with a math degree was be a math teacher. And I knew that wasn't up my alley. So then I switched over to business and finance. And I thought, okay, well, I'm good at math and finance is kind of like math. We'll just do that. My dad was a banker. And as I started to approach graduation, my dad again asked me, you know, well, what are you going to do with this business and finance degree? And I said, well, dad, you run a bank. Aren't you just going to give me a job? And he said, you know, Betsy, I don't mind if you work for a bank, but you're not going to work for my bank. And, and at that point I knew uh, I was uh, waiting tables in college and I was a terrible waitress and clearly I was going to need to do something other than wait tables because it was not going to be a, a profession I was going to excel at. So uh, I took the LSAT and uh, I did fairly well on it, but at that point in my career, uh, there are a few things that I wish somebody had told me before I went to law school. Uh, and one is, I really think it's important for everybody who goes to law school to have worked for a law firm before, because what you think lawyers do is infinitely different than what we actually do. It is not Perry Mason. Uh, you know, very few lawyers are in court every single day, and those that are, are doing that are probably doing a lot of high volume work, uh, which isn't the most exciting thing on the planet. Uh, a few things you should invest in before going to law school are listed right here, and uh, one of the books that I really, really think everybody should read before they go to law school is this book, 1L by Scott Turow. Uh, after my first year as a law student, there are a lot of emotions you're feeling. You feel very inadequate and you feel like you're failing at everything. And I read that book on winter break after, during my first year. And it really made me realize that everything I felt about law school was very normal, that everyone was feeling that way. And anybody who says they weren't feeling that way was probably lying to you. <laughs> Um, so I took the LSAT, I got a fairly high score and my first thought was, I think I want to go to Duke. I think I want to go to Duke university and go to law school. It seemed very prestigious. Um, and one of the reasons I really wanted to go was because I had mentioned to a professor that I wanted to do to apply and he told me I couldn't get in. And that made me want to do it even more. And uh, the real burst, uh, the real burst to my bubble was when I talked to my dad about going to Duke. And the realization hit me when he said, you know, even if you got in, I can't afford to send you there. And it was kind of one of the first slaps in the face I ever got in the real world. It was, uh, you know, I was so used to my dad always saying, work hard, try hard, you can do anything. But I don't think he saw a huge value in going to one school that was five times more expensive than some of the other schools I could have gone to. And so I applied to UMKC, I applied to the University of Arkansas and I applied to Mizzou. Uh, I got in at all three and I really thought I was gonna go down to Fayetteville and be a Razorback. And I had to interview at UMKC and I drove up here and it was okay. And then on the way home, I got lost and I'm driving up and down Ward Parkway, looking at these giant homes, these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful estates. And for a girl from Sykeston who's going to college in Fulton, I didn't see houses like that. I didn't see neighborhoods like that. In my towns, you might see one house in the entire town that's that big. And here there were just neighborhoods of homes that were huge and beautiful, well kept and manicured, lawn. And I thought, you know, I think I can come on up here. 
So my cousin, uh, Frank Miller, he's now a judge down in Cape County, but uh, he was coming to law school here. And so I sort of followed him on up here. Uh, I always thought my specialty was going to be estate planning, or business planning, something very transactional that would complement my business degree. And after I graduated, somebody once told me, you know, you don't pick your law, your specialty, your specialty picks you. And it's very true. Um, you know, people told me I couldn't get into law school. They told me I couldn't afford to go to law school. There were people who told me I'd never graduate from law school. And they told me I would never be in the top 10%, that I'd never pass the bar exam. Uh, people have told me I'd never find a job because I wasn't in the top 10%. And so based on those values my dad had instilled in me and my mom since I was a really young kid, guess what? I kind of did it anyway. <laughs> and I hope that one of the things you can get out of this lecture is that no matter what anybody says, if you keep trying and you keep trying, uh, you know, the people who don't succeed are really just the ones who give up and give up too early. So, what is the big point of telling you all of this? Uh, you know, you can see sort of my path in my legal career and how I started and uh, you kind of bounced all over the place. So you do criminal law and then investment banking and you were a waitress and you worked in financial services. And I would probably say the single greatest move I ever made in my career was going to be a clerk for Judge Trout out in Independence. Um, you really got to learn the court system, uh, learn how to proceed through the court system. You learned how pleadings moved through the court system. And most importantly, you really learned to develop relationships with other attorneys in town uh, so that you can learn their style of lawyering. You learned uh, not only what kind of lawyer you want to be, but you also learn what kind of lawyer you don't want to be. And sometimes that can be even more valuable pieces of information. Uh, eventually I did uh, own my own practice. I opened it almost 10 years ago and uh, it's been quite a journey and pretty, pretty fun. Uh, but the entire point of telling you all of this is really so that you can see that every step of the way in your legal career, if you're not taking a linear path, I think that's almost better than being the kid who's 16 years old, who knows exactly what they want to do, exactly where they want to go to college, exactly the degree that they want, um, and they've got it all planned out. You know, the world needs those people, but if you're not one of them, that's okay too. Because each step of the way, I think you learn more about yourself and you learn what you like and what you don't like. And you're only really going to get that information by trying a whole lot of different things. Sometimes you're going to find out that the things you're really good at aren't the things that really energize you and inspire you and are things that you want to live in and do every day. Um, you know, I was really good at math, but I would have been a terrible math teacher. Uh, and at the end of the day, math isn't what inspires me. I figured out that what really inspires me is the ability to help people. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell everybody is that, you know, if you don't know what you want to do, and what you want to be and where you're going to go, not only is it okay at 19, but you know, sometimes as a 40 year old woman with three kids and a law practice and a mortgage and all kinds of responsibilities, sometimes I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, sometimes I think I want to go retire on a beach and write a book. Uh, so it, it's all a work in progress. And those things that you need and, uh, to get out of life now may not be the things you need to get out of life later. You know, when you're in college, you spend so much time focusing on how smart you are, what 
college you got into, what your resume looks like, what your gear you're going to get it from, how many friends you have, how many likes you have on Instagram. And I feel like we're very conditioned to believe right now that your success is tied to things like money and vacations and what kind of home you have and all the things, the, the very tangible things that people are so concerned with. But as you get older, I think people should really be less defined by those things and much more defined by your values. And I think you're going to find success in doing things and having a career that really lets you live your values rather than live by the things that you might be good at or things that give you a lot of money and a lot of things. For example, I could have been the smartest kid in my law school class and I could have gotten, uh, you know, I could have been the top score on the bar exam, but if I'm not able to care about and have empathy for the clients that are walking in my door every day, why would they ever want to hire me? And you can have, you can be the smartest person in the room and know all the law from backwards and forwards and sideways and every which way but loose. But if you're standing in front of Judge Pfeiffer up at the Court of Appeals, and he asks you a question and you see your argument taking a turn, if you're not able to adapt and change right there on the spot, you're never going to be able to effectively advocate for your client. If you're not going to demonstrate that you can be a loyal employee, why would your boss ever promote you to being partner? Um, If you can't, uh, you know, have the kind of work ethic and perseverance that that I hope I have and I hope I instill in my kids, you know, how would would I have ever gotten where I am in life? Uh, I would never have owned a a law practice. Uh, I probably would have worked for somebody else for the rest of my life because uh, you you just have to have a certain amount of work ethic and ingenuity and stick-to-itiveness in order to get by. So based on that, um, I kind of want to open it up and see if people have questions about what I do, how I do it, or, uh, you know, talk to me about what values you think are important that you want to base your life around and your career around. All right, folks, if you have any questions at all, um, thank you, Betsy, first of all. Um, But if anyone has any questions at all for um, our speaker, please, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll give you a minute to type and and kick things off a little bit. Um, And and if I can ask you a question, Betsy, that'd be great. Uh, So what is the most important opportunity you've ever been presented with in your career? Well, it's kind of a toss up. Um, I will always be grateful to Judge Trout who gave me what I call my first real job out of law school. Um, if he hadn't taken a chance on a, you know, a dingy blonde girl from the boot heel who talked with a real thick Southern accent who, you know, a lot of people in Kansas City, Missouri might have thought was a little goofy at the time. Uh, if he hadn't taken that chance on me, I, I don't know if I would be where I am today. Um, and for whatever reason, he was nice enough and saw something in me that uh, that really helped boost my career and my confidence as an attorney, as a woman, as a lawyer, as a, a human being in general. And uh, I really got to develop a really nice relationship with him. And it's a relationship I cherish to this day. Um, And that was a really pivotal moment in my career for her. The other big pivotal moment was the decision to open my own law practice. Um, I really think it has been a very positive experience. It has challenged me in ways I never would have been challenged otherwise. 
Um, at times, being a solo practitioner, you have to be all things to all people. So I'm the marketing guru. I'm the receptionist sometimes. I'm the paralegal. I'm the HR trainer. I'm the director. At times, I've been the bookkeeper. Um, I, I've sort of worn a lot of hats, and uh, it, it's really developed a whole lot of skills that I never knew I had. Uh, you know, becoming an arbitrator was, was a skill that I got to develop that I, it made me realize, I think I'm pretty good at this. And I didn't know that before I gave it a try. Um, I also became a mediator and I mediate landlord tenant cases in associate circuit court. And who knew that was a cool skill that I had. I had no idea I even possessed that skill. Um, before I started doing it. But at the same time, I looked back on my career and I go, you know, the work that I do, most of the uh, adversarial work is really done outside of the courtroom. And law is done kind of behind the scenes before you ever get to court. Uh, a lot of times by the time you've gotten to court, you, your opposing counsel probably already knows your argument. They just disagree. And so it, it's interesting to uh, uh, be able to develop those skills in a completely different setting as a third party neutral rather than as a, a persuasive argument. Wonderful, thank you. And we have some questions now, so I'm gonna ask a few from the chat. Um, so first we'll start with Sarah Ayers who asked, what is the most memorable or meaningful case you have worked on? Oh. Well, I'd like to think I haven't worked on it yet, but um, let's see. You know, my favorite case is probably not going to sound real exciting, um, but I, at one point in my career, represented this guy who was an over-the-road truck driver, and he was, uh, he had lost his truck to a mechanic shop in Oklahoma and they had taken possession of it and I filed him for bankruptcy in order to get his truck back because if he didn't get his truck, he wasn't gonna be able to do his job and if he couldn't do his job, he wasn't gonna be able to keep his home, uh, feed his family, his wife was about to leave him. I mean, there were all sorts of things that in his life that were tied to this truck that if he didn't get it back, he, he was going to be in pretty bad shape. And he was talking to me. Uh, I, I'm, I was a little concerned. Maybe he had some uh, mental health problems and was probably depressed. And personally, I was concerned about him and whether he was going to continue living if I didn't help him get his truck back, uh, which sounds a little silly to you and me, but at the time it, it meant everything to him. And I was, very, very pregnant with my third child. <laughs> and uh, we were right in the middle of, of litigation. Uh, and my, the baby came early. And so I came home from the hospital with my third child. And I think it was about a week after I came home, I had a hearing set and I had to litigate whether this guy was gonna get his truck back or not, whether the, the stay was in effect on it. Um, uh, it was a telephone hearing and they had a rather large law firm down in Oklahoma City representing them. Uh, they had one of the largest firms in Kansas City representing the creditor. Uh, there was the United States trustees office got involved um, they thought my client was might have been committing fraud. Uh, and then the chapter 13 trustees were, were putting a lot of pressure on my client to just surrender the truck. And I stayed up at night, you know, taking care of this baby. I was getting no sleep and the telephone hearing I'm bouncing the baby in my lap and praying to God, this poor baby didn't cry while I'm talking to a judge. And I presented my argument and at the end of my presentation, I feel like you could have heard a pin drop on the phone because not any, I mean, there were 15 other lawyers on the other side and not one of them had a comeback. And I thought, oh my God, I just did that. 
Uh, and the, the, we, won the, we won the motion, we won the pleading, we won the case, the guy got his truck back. And when I got to call him and tell him, you know, hey, you need to go down to Oklahoma and pick your truck up, it'll be ready at four o'clock. The guy started crying like a baby. And it just made me feel like Wonder Woman from the movies. And I, you know, just annihilated somebody. It was awesome. It was one of the best feelings you'll ever get as a lawyer is knowing you've helped somebody. Cool. Professor, can I jump in and ask a question? Because it's, it's one of the things that I think as a judge in the Kansas City community, uh, we, we get to see lawyers um, at their best and sometimes at their worst. But what we know about Betsy is that uh, one of the things that's so, so, so important to her, and she just mentioned it briefly, but it's her children. I mean, she wears so many different hats and she serves the community in so many different ways. But one of the reasons that I think uh, judges in our community and lawyers in our community have so much respect for Betsy is that she's able to balance uh, her life and she's able to keep perspective uh, in her life. And she is just as proud of wearing the hat of mother as she is of servant leader in a courtroom or uh, with a charitable foundation. And I wonder, Betsy, if you could talk about the importance of balance uh, in a career and in a life journey. Sure, sure. Um, I find it comical that you think I have balance, first of all. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, I want to live a life that my kids could look at and say and sort of model themselves after. And sometimes if there is ever an unhealthy balance, I have some pretty grounded friends and family who kind of remind me uh, when I'm struggling to uh, get something done or if I'm overwhelmed, they'll say, if your daughter came to you in this situation, what would you tell her? And all of a sudden it sort of becomes clear what, what you need to do. Um, one of the things that I've done recently is uh, I, I've been a pretty overcommitted on some nonprofit boards that I serve on. And I decided to, in order to really handle my volunteer work the way I wanted to handle my volunteer work, I was going to need to reduce that, the, the quantity and focus more on quality. And so, uh, you know, I don't do what I do without a whole lot of help. I really don't. Um, particularly now in the age of COVID-19. I mean, I, I hired a nanny who has a teaching degree because I have a lot of strengths, but homeschooling my children is not one of them. And uh, I hired a bookkeeper and I have a husband who travels for work, but when he's here, you know, he, he really pitches in and I couldn't do the things I do without an entire team of people who can help. Um, I go to a great church. Uh, if, if I had been 19, 20 years old sitting at Westminster and heard somebody say that, you know, a lot of my friends are going to come from the church, uh, I probably would have laughed. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, my kids go to Catholic school, I belong to a Catholic church, and they've really been an awesome community. Uh, when somebody gets sick, there's always somebody to bring dinner over or bring over soup that they've made. And, uh, you know, my, my parents aren't well. Both of my parents are disabled now and live in a nursing home. And sometimes I got to drop everything and run to the hospital for somebody. And I can't tell you how many people would be willing to pitch in and say, I'll pick up your kids from school. You know, I'll drop off a dinner tomorrow. I'll get Susie Q to, to soccer practice. No big deal. I mean, you really need those people to keep you grounded. Um, you know, when I, when I was in law school, I thought there was going to be a really big, important thing I was going to do with my life. 
And those thoughts always revolved around some big case I was going to win or some argument I would present or a big client I would ha happen to get. And as I got older, I was in the hospital room and I'm holding him and it's two o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden it dawned on me like this was the really big important thing I was going to do with my life. It's my family. It didn't have anything to do with my caseload. It was, it was my family. And uh, not that my caseload isn't important, but that family also supports me in a way that allows me to do that work in the community and in my career to be an example to everybody. So a few more questions, um, specifically about some of your past experiences from some of our students. So one of our next questions is from Kellis Heber, who asks, what experience do you have specifically from Westminster that have helped you to flourish as an attorney and a person today? Hmm. Um, you know, I was a member of the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority. Um, I probably didn't strike people in law school as a sorority girl, but it was an incredibly positive experience for me. Uh, coming from a small town where I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, it, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a lot in common with a lot of other women in that small town. And Kappa Alpha Theta was the first time in my life that I had a built-in group of friends who basically looked at me and said, you do you and we're going to be your friends. You know, whatever that is, if you want to be a kindergarten teacher, if you want to be a nurse, if you want to be a microbiologist or an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or whatever it is, you know, we're, we're going to be here to support you. And until then, I honest to God, I didn't know women could be like that. Uh, and it really was inspiring. And I think that's a lot of the reason I got into the Association for Women Lawyers uh, after, after I graduated from law school, because uh, I wanted to do something uh, in my own profession that, that would provide that support and that realization for other women, uh, to not see other women as a threat, uh, but to know that if we all supported each other, that was the only way we were all going to get ahead. We have a couple of questions about some advice for careers. So first is from Joseph Garner who asks, I want to work in local or state government. So I'm planning to get a law degree after Westminster. Would this be the best choice? Um, I think it depends on what you want to do in local and state government. I mean, if you want to be a prosecutor, or if you want to work for the county counselor's office or do other, some sort of other governmental work as a lawyer, yeah, I think a law degree would be a really nice asset. Uh, I would probably recommend, um, you know, I've sat in board meetings for the Bar Association where a brand new lawyer sits down next to me and has told me he owes $200,000 in student loans. If you're going to go work in local and state government, don't take out $200,000 worth of student loans <laughs> um, because you're not going to get paid enough to really recoup the value of that degree. So if you went to a UMKC or a Mizzou or a state school where the tuition's a little bit lower and you can work your last couple of years and take out fewer student loans, yeah, I think, I think you know, go for it. Uh, there are a lot of really good government jobs that are available that government work is probably, in my opinion, going to give you the most work-life balance. You know, if I had been a career clerk, it, it would have been an awesome job. Really, really awesome. Uh, because you make decent money, but it's, it's relatively eight to five. Um, a lot of those jobs are low stress. Um, I have a friend who represents uh, the city of Lee Summit, and she works for the police department, basically. And uh, you would think she would be dealing in a lot of criminal law, but what she really does is a lot of employment law. 
So if you go into local or state government work, I would recommend you make sure you know what, what you're chewing on before you just bite it off. So you spoke a lot about skills and some of the values and skills that you thought were really important here. So we have kind of a follow-up question on that, which is from Tim Fitzpatrick asks, when you want to develop a skill into a career, what is a good way to practice that skill? Hmm. Can you give me an example? I don't know if uh, I can here? wait and see if Tim posts anything. My guess yeah. is asking if uh, in, in, if we talk about becoming good at having the skills of being someone who is really empathetic or who has a great deal of perseverance or who is able to um, translate some of those kind of intrinsic things that you mentioned uh, into things that are going to further you in your career in the long run. How do you develop that? Oh. I think, well, you can't just talk the talk. You've really got to walk the walk. Um, I would, I would probably recommend maybe you get involved in a nonprofit organization that is going to help you develop whatever skill it is that you think would benefit you in your career. Um, you know, the Women Lawyers Association helped me develop some uh, pretty good networking skills. Uh, being a part of the Junior League of Kansas City uh, really helped me develop some leadership skills, uh, particularly at the board level. Uh, to understand how to run a meeting. And sometimes if you give just a little bit of, of your time and you're present throughout that time, mentally, physically uh, present, sometimes you can develop a skill you didn't even know you had uh, just by trying to do something good for your community. So uh, I, I was curious to hear more about your experience in running your own practice. And I think this next question is good. Kevin Schiller asks, how stressed do you get overall running your own practice and how stressful uh, in contrast were your previous jobs as well? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, lawyers kind of thrive on stress. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I am a working mother of three and I take care of two disabled parents and I run a law practice. So stress just is part of the job. Um, and how you deal with that stress uh, can certainly indicate whether this is going to be a good career choice for you. Um, if the way you deal with stress is by going to the bar and drinking a case of beer every night, legal profession is probably going to exacerbate that in infinitely. Um, so I, you, you might consider a healthier outlet for that. Um, the lowest stress job I've ever had, best job I've ever had was driving a beer cart in law school for sure. That was super fun. Uh, definitely low stress there. Um, it, my other, I mean, I, being a law clerk was a really fun job and very low stress because at the end of the day, you don't have to take responsibility for anything. The judge signed the order, you know, not you. <laughs> you just all judges it. are awesome human beings. And so it's just a great opportunity. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Betsy. Uh oh, I, I mean, being a law clerk is awesome. Uh, and that was really low stress job. Being an associate was more stressful uh, only because the type of associate I was, I worked for a small firm, so I had a lot of client contact. And as an attorney, people come to you with the worst, most disgusting, horrific part of their life. And they spill it out all over your table. And you're kind of like their mom and you have to go and clean up the mess. And sometimes there's only so much of the mess that you can clean up. Um, most people who need legal help 
you know, uh, the, the majority of people who need legal help have a lot of chaos going on in their life. And over the years, I've realized there's only so much of the chaos I can contain and I can control and I can help with. And I can give my clients resources for other parts of their chaotic lives, but I can't own all of them. And one thing lawyers do exceptionally well is, and you have to develop this skill just as a matter of survival in the legal profession. You have to be able to compartmentalize your feelings. So when I'm done for the day and I got to go coach my kid's soccer team, I can't bring the over the road truck driver's problem to the soccer field. I can't do that because I can't do that to those kids. Uh, and when I come home from work, uh, the case that I lost can't turn into a fight with my husband about whose turn it was to unload the dishwasher because I lost at the court hearing. Um, so you have to be able to sort of check your, your problems at the door and, and leave them back in your office so that you can go home uh, at the end of the day. You know, the, the, the biggest reason I never became a prosecutor uh, I worked there in law school as a law clerk, but one of the last jobs I had as a clerk was to write an appellate brief uh, about, the case was about a woman who had smothered her baby with a pillow. And after I wrote that, I graduated from law school and I said, you know, if I become a prosecutor, I could do a lot of good things. But at the end of the day, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come home to my husband and my kids and pretend like the world is a normal place to live. I think that would wear on me after a while. So I, I, I experimented with it. I liked it. There were a lot of things about that I liked about it. But at the end of the day, I think it was going to beat me up rather than inspire me. So I, I, I knew that wasn't a road I wanted to travel down. So we have a few minutes left if anyone else has any questions they want to submit. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering if you could talk for a minute about uh, the role of mentors in your career and how mentors shaped your experience through college or law school or as you were developing your career. Sure, sure. I mean, you're looking at one. Judge Pfeiffer is a great mentor. Um, you know, I've applied to be a judge several times and, and he's sort of tutored me through the process. Every time I have a conversation with him, I feel like I'm taking a political science class because he gives me an education in Missouri politics. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, to go back to Judge Trout, he was an incredible mentor. You know, before I went to law school, I uh, worked for a small law firm in my hometown of Sykeston in college you know, on Christmas break and over the summers. And Joe Blanton down in, in Sykeston was an incredible mentor. Uh, he's probably the reason I went to law school. He, he was kind of like Judge Trout. He just saw something in me that was more than the silly blonde girl from Podunk. And he, he believed in me and it gave me a lot of confidence. My, my grandmother moved to Sykeston right after she graduated from high school in Kansas City. So she grew up in Kansas City, graduated. Her parents were so poor, they sent her down to the boot hill to get a job. And she hitchhiked down, down to the boot hill and she got a job as the original Joe Blanton's secretary. And years later, I worked for Joe Blanton as his law clerk. And I think to this day, she'd get such a kick out of the fact that her granddaughter came back to Kansas City and is a lawyer. And it's kind of a full circle sort of story. Okay, if anyone else wants to submit any questions, we still have a couple of minutes left as well um, to talk with our speaker. One question, since you've obviously had some experience at Westminster and ended up um, going into law school. So, so often I have a lot of conversations with students who say, I'm thinking about going to law school, but I'm not sure. So if you were having those conversations with students of, I'm thinking about going to law school, but I'm not sure, how would you advise them in terms of what 
considerations to be making and what to think about when making that decision, if it's the right path for them. Uh, one thing I would do is uh, read those books on the list, which I can email to anyone if you reach out to me, um, because I think they would give you a little insight into what it's kind of like to go to law school. Um, one thing I did when I opened my practice was I emailed the Alumni Association at Westminster and asked for a list of all of the lawyers in the Kansas City area. And I took them all out to lunch or coffee or drinks to tell them what I was doing. And there are resources available right there at Westminster. I mean, you, you could ask for the same list that I got and maybe give people a call and just say, hey, I'm, I'm a Westminster ki college kid. I'm thinking about going to law school. What do you think? What should I major in? Uh, you know, think about what you're interested in. And again, you know, going back to, to the whole presentation, you know, don't just think about the things you're good at. Think about the things you like to do, what you like about them, and see if that gels with what really happens in the profession of law. And you know, thanks to Dr. John and Tobias, we now, um, over the last couple of years, we've developed a Westminster Bar Association. Uh, and we actually, and I, Betsy is a member of that, and we actually now have this group of, it's all Westminster alumni that have gone on to legal careers. And that means using a law degree, not necessarily to be a lawyer, but using it in their careers in a different way than being in a courtroom or drafting uh, an estate plan or whatnot. And so now I feel like students at Westminster really do have this, this wealth of information at their fingertips uh, because I think Betsy's advice is good. Uh, and that is, if you are thinking about being a lawyer, talk to lawyers and talk to lawyers that do different kinds of things with their law degree and, and that's one of the benefits of Westminster College is that we are still such a small community uh, that there are, you know, two or 300 lawyers across the country and even across the pond um, um, with some lawyers over in England. But, uh, but we've got Westminster alums that believe me, they will, they will drop what they're doing to have a conversation, whether it's by email or by phone, uh, for sure. Thank you. Lots of good advice. And, and Professor Gibson posted a few things in the chat as well um, as, as the overseer of our pre-law program for any of st our students that are interested as well. We have one last question here, and I think it's a good one to end on for Betsy. And Kellis Heber asked, what are your aspirations beyond the law? You know, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been doing is applying to be a judge. And sort of a grueling process. It's a very humbling process. Um, and right at the moment after the pandemic happened, um, my, my phone just started to explode and every client I've ever had called me in the month of March, in the last two weeks of March. And I very quickly realized that in the grand scheme of things, I could probably do the most good right now by continuing to practice law. So I kind of hit the pause button on it. Um, but one of the conversations I had with Jeremy, who's, who kind of was the guy who asked me to do this, um, talked about this very question, you know, what, what, are you, what are your aspirations? And I used to think that every time I moved up a notch on the career ladder, the moment I, was, I, was, I moved up, I always started thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And what can I do that's next? What's higher? And at some point I started to be concerned that maybe it meant I wasn't fulfilled or happy with the rung that I, like the step that I was on. And then I read this book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I think it's by a guy named Frankel. And he, uh, it, it sounds like a very heavy book and it has a heavy topic. It's a guy who uh, endured the Holocaust in a concentration camp and he writes a book. But at the end of the book, 
I realized that the constant striving for more is really every single person's purpose for living. Um, whether it's to have another kid or to send your kid to college or to climb up your career ladder further, every single uh, desire uh, doesn't mean that you're not happy with where you're at. It's just a natural progression in life. So I would hope that when somebody again asks me, you know, what your aspirations in law are, whether I'm 40 years old or 60 years old, I hope I have an answer to that. You know, when somebody asks me what my favorite case was, I hope I can always answer with, I hope I haven't had it yet. I hope I haven't argued it yet. I hope it hadn't walked in my door yet. Okay, that's a wonderful place to finish up. Uh, I wish we could stay a little bit longer, but thank you so much for all of your time and your insights and sharing what your experiences have been. I think it's particularly helpful coming from someone who went through Westminster to see what the experience looks like and what some of the opportunities look like on the other side of, of this place as well. So thank you very much. So everybody, thank you for joining us for this session. Thank you to Judge Pfeiffer. Um, everyone give Betsy some virtual applause as well. And uh, again, thank you for attending this session and thank you to Betsy Lynch for being here with us today. Thanks everyone. Have sure. If, any, if anybody ever wants to reach out to, you can always call me. Thanks so much. All right, have a good rest of the day, everybody.